Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this conference. I think it's very interesting to increase the cooperation between Iceland and Norway on this in this field. And um, I will be discussing very old material as well as pretty new. And um, obviously, it's um, it's a pleasure also to uh, to have this opportunity to uh, to mention Nansen. And um, so here are the contents of the talk. I will begin by uh, reviewing extremely briefly how Fritjof Nansen is connected to sea ice. Well, he is um, uh, extremely talented, was an extremely talented man, and I think not many are in the position like he was to, uh, for so many fields or study, to claim him as their man. And uh, I'm sure many disciplines consider Nansen as um, an expert in their field. And uh, for me, that is very true of the sea ice. I will then discuss briefly what is um, uh, what is to be found on uh, sea ice in Norwegian archives, which is plenty. And then I will end, uh, end with a, a very short description of a, a journey into the melting ice this autumn. Um, here are a few pictures from uh, the Viking expedition or, uh, or journey into the Greenland Sea and Denmark Strait. Nansen then uh, a student of zoology uh, went to to hunt seals and um, made a very interesting observation on the sea ice and the connection between sea ice and um, and the seals and um, describing phenomenon that um, that is um, still used today. For example, I I uh, in the, just north of Jan Mayen, there's a specific feature called the Otten, which was known for centuries in Norway as as one of the hunting grounds for, for seals. And this is a very um, interesting area also for the creation of, of deep sea and and, um, and obviously for ice formation. Here is another expedition of, of nonsense when he um, plant and, and went over the glacier on Greenland in 1882. And I'm not sure if you can see it, there, there is a red line where he crossed the sea ice field of East Greenland. And obviously it was supposed to be a rather short journey across, but they were brought so far south by the, the strong current, and the East Greenland current and on the sea ice, that they, you can, you can see, hopefully, the, the very deep loop towards south before they had to travel back north and then across the glacier. You can imagine how much more difficult this made the made the um, the journey. But at the same time, he made such thorough observations that um, that I'm sure have helped in this field to this day. And um, and uh, I should have mentioned earlier that this combination of his, of being working with the industry, with the sealers, and then doing scientific research was really a fortunate uh, combination, I think. And then possibly the, the most famous journey of his, when he worked with um, the ship Fram, went into the Arctic Ocean, and uh, this was because um, he had heard that remains of, of a ship, Jeanette, had been found, a ship that had broken, been broken in the ice in the Arctic Ocean was found off South Greenland. He made this observation that, that he wanted to test out on the drift of sea ice. And, uh, well, unfortunately, he didn't make it quite to the pole, but, but still, it was quite an um, epic journey. And um, the um, scientific results from it were 
absolutely extensive both on the uh, seeing how how the Arctic Ocean was, how deep it was, and um, making all kinds of so biological and uh, physical observations. Now, to look at sea ice data in Norwegian archives, um, I had the pleasure of, of working in the Norsk Polar Institute a few years back and going through the archives. This was mainly because um, there were really um, detailed records going back a few hundred years. That, um, that the sealers and whalers, by writing um, logbooks, which have then been, been um, collected and, and, um, and treasured, and, um, and then um, scientists in the Norsk Polar Institute had digitized them and, um, and had also kept all, all the original data. Uh, the CS record from them stems from the middle of the 16th century, which is which is extremely valuable. The um, I think I think this combination of uh, industry and science has been very fruitful in Norway. Both well, people had had um, had this background in having to work and, and so knowing the the, um, the physical environment very well. Now, very early on, and, and now this, this is, um, has been standardized very well today, but very early on, Norwegian scientists started classifying the data, for example, the sea ice data, both um, according to ice concentration, which of course um, has, has a great value for, for estimating the mass balance, but also according to data reliability. And um, to name just few, uh, Torbni Vinje and Ger Kenli at the, at the uh, Norsk Polar Institute and also the, the Meteorology Institute. And, um, but this has been going on for quite a while. I have, here's a letter uh, written by Adolf Hör where he is describing that Otto Svartrup, you, you will know these names, I'm sure, and, um, and also Hermansen. They would go along, this, this is written in, in 1923, and they were instructed to go along the coast and try to collect as many logbooks as possible. And um, I've, I've got quite a good collection of, of letters connected to this, and, and they were very successful. They, they got um, uh, tens and hundreds of, of logbooks collected there with very um, uh, valuable data. And I think this shows a great, or even if it's almost 100 years ago, it showed a great um, uh, what was your vision of how important this stuff is, was. And this has been the basis of this, um, this Norwegian database. And um, there were other information from this archive. I'm not sure if everybody um, reads in, in this conference reads Norwegian, but um, this is a, an announcement or, or a report um, that was published in the Norsk Sjöfartstidende in, um, in April in 1913, where they say two fishermen, Aron Hansen and Amalik Gundersen, that they outside Utsire in in uh, Southwest Norway spotted an iceberg, and um, obviously this is a, a, a joke. This is um, this is um, they try to emphasise that this also happened at this particular day in 1849. This is so. This is um, happening on April 1st. But uh, okay, this was in Southwest Norway. But in 1882, there was a 81-82. Then there was actually a very strong uh, or, or, or severe ice here, and um, not far off the northern Norway there were quite a few icebergs. So, so it, it's not um, it's not a complete joke that there were, there are icebergs in, in Norway, but this this one happened to be a joke. And um, I've got also here quite a few reports and letters 
which are um, quite interesting politically because um, in 29 there was a debate between Denmark and Norway about East Greenland and I've got here letters also that were, were uh, kept in the North Polar Institute about how sealers, Norwegian sealers, they think it's a bit unfair that they collect all this information about sea ice in the um, Norwegian, in the Greenland Sea, and obviously at that time Norwegian uh, activities in eastern Greenland were quite extensive with hunting and, and fishing and and all that, and uh, so the sealers thought it was a bit silly to send all this detailed information to the Danish Met Office, or uh, sorry, the Danish Met Institute. Um, but in 1899. Uh, DMI, Danish National Institute, became the center of collecting and publishing sea ice data from the whole of the Arctic Ocean. And so people found it a bit, people in Norway found it a bit unfair to send all this information that came from Norwegian citizens to Denmark and to have Denmark then become established uh, a center for for this and, and strengthening their claim to Eastern Greenland. And this, um, so even if the um, scientists were working really well together, it, this was causing a bit of conflict. So I checked, I checked um, when I was studying the archives of the North Polar Institute if all the ice reports had then made it to the Danish center. And as far as I could see, they had, but this was, um, it's very understandable that this comes up. This, um, they thought that they, they were, it was a, they, they were really working against themselves to send this data, but obviously they did, but at the same time they, they decided to start publishing their own kind of more detailed reports for this area. And, um, I'm, I'm glad to say I think throughout um, all kinds of political conflicts, scientists have been able to work together. I mean, even even through the Cold War and everything, then uh, people have been able to work together and find a way to to exchange information and uh, work together, which is I think a good thing. And. Um, Last now this this uh, October there was an international conference um, about on sea ice with the um, International Ice Charting Working Group that was held in Tromsø, and um, so Norway still plays a big role in in this field, and um, hopefully we we, will ha we are hosting this conference next year and hopefully this will help strengthening this both link to Norway and also strengthening sea ice studies in Iceland. And finally, just a little bit about um, about uh, the journey of um, the Snow Dragon, um, the Chinare uh, expedition with the Chinese um, icebreaker into the Arctic Ocean this, this autumn. Um, I was very lucky that um, Rannis Tosset Gunnarsson invited me to take part in this expedition. And um, because we are linking this to Norway, I'd like to show you what uh, what was waiting for us outside Svalbard. This was um, this was a, a Norwegian ship, um, I think K KV Svalbard from the Kistvatten, and um, they were just there. They were just, I think, they were not uh, being hostile. They were just reminding um, reminding us, I think, that. Uh, that they were there and, and people were being watched. And uh, on the left hand side, you can see how many people were, were uh, looking at this ship within the bridge. And then a little bit later on, when it became clear that the ship wasn't coming any nearer or not, there wasn't going to be a conflict, then people went out and wanted to have a picture taken with the Svalbard and, uh, and the ship in the background. Here is. Um, a satellite image of the uh, Arctic Ocean that was um, 
used as a basis for deciding which route to take. The original uh, plan was to go pretty much cro uh, across the Arctic Ocean, so straight north from Iceland and then heading towards the North Pole. But uh, once this one, uh, this this image, it, it's actually the, the um, um, it, it's not the basic image itself. It's been classified according to sea ice concentration. So so purple seam is, look, uh, shows the area with very very solid sea ice, very um, high concentration. And once this, so this is uh, what we had to plan the route from. And so this was um, how the plan was originally. Um, the colors of these lines indicate sea surface temperature. So blue seem, uh, is colder than, than red, obviously. And you can also see the route that um, the snow dragon took on the way west, which is within the Russian uh, kind of economic zone. And But then on the way east, and, and I should mention that Eithor Nielsen uh, was um, on that ship on the way to Iceland, and then I was lucky enough to go on the way back. And so we went um, north of Svalbard and didn't really encounter any sea ice until just north of Svalbard, and then carried on pretty much towards east until 120 degrees east, and then we went straight north, or pretty much. So um, very different conditions, very different um, uh, basically everything to what uh, Nansen had to it, it, uh, one um, almost feels ashamed to, to be on a ship and feel such luxury on going into these areas. You really think you should have a pretty hard time going there, but but that's that. Um, I guess I guess um, not many people would go there today if it, if, if they had to uh, go for so many years and and. Uh, endure such hardship, but um, in a way uh, it was quite shocking to see how the ice conditions were. There was so much melting going on and pretty much only the ice ridges had survived the summer melting. And um, as you can see from this graph, um, the snow dragon didn't really make it to the North Pole, so that's probably pretty much the only thing we have in common with with Nansen in that in that journey. But um it would have been nice to go there, but I must admit that uh, a part of me is actually quite quite happy that we didn't because once we encountered sea ice that was thicker than three meters and we couldn't continue, it was a bit of a relief to think, okay, there's still some ice that is thick enough and uh, because um, even if there are obviously great opportunities uh, connected with opening of the Arctic Ocean, it, it is really, really worrying how, how fast the development is happening. I mean, there are climate um, predictions about how the sea ice is, is, is um, shrinking, but the last few years things have been happening so much faster. And that, that really, truly is worrying. But um, along the cruise, we, um, we did quite a bit of research. We uh, were able to go out on the ice um, six times. And then there were also helicopter flights to uh, areas further away to collect information. Um, we were me measuring um, ice thickness um, by by uh, both using remote sensing and taking cores, um, looking at albedo changes, how uh, how the radiation budget is, and there were also um, oceanographic and biological research. We, we were um, studying black carbon, trying to figure out how that is affecting melting, and um, and so I would say this was really a fruitful scientific journey, and it was very interesting to, to be able to to work with the Chinese scientists on this. Now, I think 
I know pe people are predicting that ice will disappear completely, uh, at least during the summer. I, for me, I really hope that uh, that is not true, but uh, I know for, for sure that at least many are just waiting for the ice to disappear from the Russian kind of zone so that uh, people can go into this area without having to be kind of escorted by Russian icebreakers. And um, so I'm, I'm not an expert and, and uh, in uh, politics. I, I pretty much know nothing about politics, but I think this is slightly worrying. This, uh, even if it's good, uh, it's good to have people become interested in this area, but I think we, we need to tread very carefully as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Want to give an applause? It will, it will, it will, it will. Okay, Ingeberg, thank you very much. <clears throat> and now we have uh, the floor is open for questions. We we uh, can easily allow a few questions now. And uh, please, if you have questions in Reykjavik, just uh, just say so because we don't see your hands. But if you have questions here in Akureyri, you can raise your hands and. And let us know. Yes. Yeah. Um, my question is again, I'm Anna Kutula. Um My question is the scientific. Uh, were, were was the agenda set forth collaboratively between Icelandic scientific community and the Chinese community before you went, or were the Icelanders uh, simply working with the Chinese who set the uh, scientific? Um, agenda prior to your expedition? Well, there wasn't such long um, notice, really. But um, so to a large extent, I got to participate in the Chinese uh, already set plan. But then, um, then on the other hand, uh, Everything that I wanted to do, all the data that I wanted to collect or for, for uh, Icelandic scientists were really freely given away. I was really spoiled that way. I mean, they would take me on a helicopter ride to collect snow samples to, to uh, estimate the um, carbon, black carbon. And um, I'm sure if I had had more notice I would, um, and had more equipment, then that would have been very welcome as well. We, uh, I didn't mention, but we had, um, in a collaboration with, with a Nordic uh, project, uh, Nordic Center of Excellence, uh, a project called CRIG, uh, focusing on cryosphere changes. We had uh, quite a few uh, equipment set up in the bridge to, to measure um, atmospheric conditions and, uh, and suit and other particles. So I guess it was a 50-50 like that. But um, certainly for the sea ice research, then um, I will get all the data that I, uh, I like from them and, and was willing to, uh, I got to participate in their group as well. Thank you. More questions? And while the while people are thinking, Maybe I, I, I would ask you one question. You, know, you mentioned uh, or expressed to general worries about the pace of global warming and how, how fast uh, the, the polar ice is getting thinner. Was that, uh, was that sentiment affected by your journey? Did, did you uh, learn anything that you didn't know before in this journey or uh, as far as that's concerned? Yes, I think so. Um, I hadn't been before to the Arctic Ocean, so I have nothing directly to compare with, obviously. But seeing how thin the ice was and how how fast it was melting, yes, then I think it, it became more clear how how serious this is. Also, when especially when we were going back towards Bering Strait. Um, there were certain areas that we came across in the, sea, in the sea ice where only the ice rigid had melted 
and um, in that area we saw quite a lot of uh, footprints of polar bears, which showed me that um, ice ridges seem to play quite a big, big role, and, and I'm sure this they mean a lot to uh, the survival of polar bears and, and and other wildlife. Yes, we have uh, one one question, Thomas, and and then Christy. With respect to the very short period of time that we have been looking at the polar region from a scientific point of view, which is mostly after 1850, to be to be uh, optimistic. Doesn't the data that you uh, spoke of from fishermen and uh, whalers and uh, seal hunters, as well as uh, data from uh, expeditions that took place before that, become extremely valuable uh, to extend the, uh, the time that we can evaluate changes in this environment? Thank you. Yes, um, indeed, and um, the database that I, I mentioned, the Norwegian one, stemming back to the 1600s, is, is um, obviously extremely valuable, and it's, quite frankly, it's sometimes very hard to believe these, um, this information because it's so different from our reality now. Um, but yes, the, the whalers and sealers, and uh, this is also was also in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. This data has been kept extremely well and uh, is now in the, um, the kind of overall database of the National Snow and Ice Database in, in Boulder and Col Colorado. So I think scientists really do realize how important this information is. So yes, especially because the whalers and sealers, they would typically be around the ice edge, so they would be recording ex exactly what we want to, to know about. Yes, thank you. We've been unmuted by the host, so Trusty <laughs> uh, Walsom. Uh, Ingeberg, <clears throat> I know uh, most of your uh, people on the ship were uh, scientists, but uh, did they at all discuss the importance of the shipping route for the Chinese in the future? And uh, did they also maybe uh, privately uh, discuss uh, that it's a little bit worrisome, that this whole new no ocean, world ocean, is governed by only five nations? And uh, the, 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 the U.S. and the Russians sit at the Bering Strait, and there's also a small, only a small opening into, into the North Atlantic Ocean around Iceland. So, uh, um, would, do, do we have the feeling they would like to have stake more claims to this new ocean, like the French are doing now with Michel Rochard? It's quite hard to say. Um, sadly, I don't speak Chinese. I'm sure I would have. Uh, had uh, more information if I, if if things were so. But it was very clear that they were interested in when the ice goes out of the Russian zone. That that is quite important to them. And um, they, well, the people on board were mostly scientists, and they they have been studying how how the disappearing sea ice affects climate in China, which they find extremely worrying, both because um, they've experienced uh, frost rain during winter, which has devastated large areas, and they're also extremely worried about the sea level change. About them make, uh, planning to make claims, um, no, I, I really, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> But um, I think they, as many people, as many other nations, would probably like uh, big areas to be a kind of international waters rather than, than being dependent on, on going uh, 
or be, yeah, be, being dependent on other nations, I guess, for especially for scientific research. But um, I, I can't really com comment on uh, on their plans regarding other things. <laughs>